Hey friends, it is Chris Lowen here again with another episode from our Outside the Walk podcast. This is a podcast where we have a lot of conversations with people of different perspectives than what many of us would normally encounter in everyday life. The ideas and the topics that we discuss in each episode are there for us to consider, but there is no expectation or pressure for everyone to agree, nor are these even official positions of Cross Through Church. The desire is to learn through healthy dialogue from a posture of curiosity without feeling the pressure to agree with everything that is said in each of these episodes. So in today's episode, we have a friend of ours on the show named Dr. Scott McKnight. Scott is a recognized authority on the New Testament, early Christianity, and the historical Jesus. He has been the author or editor of some 85 books, and he is the professor of New Testament at Northern Seminary in Lyle, Illinois. In today's conversation, we are going to be talking about a book that he has just recently published on the book of Revelation. It is called Revelation for the Rest of Us, a prophetic call to follow Jesus as a dissident disciple. I know that you are going to really enjoy this conversation because we certainly did. And we are going to put the link for this book in the description below. But without further ado, Please welcome to the show, the one and only Dr. Scott McKnight. Hey, Scott, it is uh, so good to have you join me and Chris here on our Outside the Walls podcast. How are you doing today? Doing very well, and thank you for inviting me. Good to be with you. Today, what we want to do, and, and this is our podcast episode that we've been looking forward to for a while already. We want to talk about your the book that you recently published which is called Revelation for the Rest of Us, a prophetic call to follow Jesus as a dissident disciple. And I've read the book myself. Scott, uh, Chris has just recently started. It is a book that I've really appreciated myself. And so we want to talk about the book and some of the things that you address in the book and really get at the heart of what you what you call uh, is a prophetic call to follow Jesus as a dissident disciple. So just to start things off, just to start things off, why don't we start off by addressing the first question? So many of us as Christians in this area have been raised believing that Revelation is a predictive prophecy of future events that are starting to take place now in our day today. You call this reading Revelation as speculation. What is wrong with that way of reading Revelation? When, uh, okay, I mean, what is wrong? Um, okay, let me just give you a couple things. The first is the book was written in the first century for seven churches in Western Asia Minor about their situation. Okay, so it was written about Rome. Revelation 17 and 18 is a revelation of, of a Christian perspective, apocalyptic perspective on Rome. The second thing is, uh, when it is turned into constant prophetic predictions of who in the modern world is doing what, it both has always gotten everything wrong, because no one knows the end. But I mean, just think about the number of people who've speculated that it was, you know, it was uh, Hitler and it was Mussolini and it was Stalin and before that, you know, it was uh, the Allied, the Axis powers. Uh, well, it goes back to World War II. Some people thought it was the Civil War. Some people thought it was the, I mean, it just goes on and on. Cotton Mather was totally into this stuff in the Puritan mm-hmm. days in the United States. So they've always been wrong. And the problem they had in being wrong was not that they didn't discern that certain political powers bore resemblance to Babylon in Revelation 17, it's that they locked in on it being a prediction of that particular person at that particular time. Instead Mm -hmm. of discerning political corruption, it became prediction of political figures. That should be a tweet right there. That was pretty good. That was very good. I don't, think, I don't, think, it's, I don't <laughs> think that's in the book. It should be in the book. Um, and, um, and then the third thing that I would say is a problem is that it leads to a discipleship of escape 
Hmm. of, uh, you know, I'm a believer, so therefore I'm going to be raptured. I won't be here for this stuff. So too bad for those those uh, doofuses that have to experience the tribulation or whatever in Revelation uh, all 6 to 16. That fails the book's fundamental theme of being a witness and learning how to worship. So it fails at the level of the Christian life, which in the hmm. book of Revelation— as a witness, is someone who discerns the presence of Babylon in this world and resists it, speaks up, speaks out, and, you know, in times lays their life on the line in order to follow Jesus as the Lamb of God. So how's that for an answer? That is a, that is a great answer. Thank you. So now, if Revelation isn't predictive prophecy, what is it? And, and how would the first century hearers have received it? What, what were they taking from this? Okay, I wouldn't say the book of Revelation is not predictive prophecy. There are some predictive elements to it, dimensions to it. Like there's going to be justice and there's going to be judgment yeah. in the world, etc. You know, but uh, nailing down everything as prophecy, we'll, we'll get it. We'll get it wrong. Now, what was your what was the second follow up question? <laughs> So, so then if it is, well, okay, so then it has a little bit. That's, th by the way, thank you for clarifying. It does have some predictive, you know, the big, big story. Yep. Um, but if it isn't all these details of, you know, whatever, this guy is Hitler or this guy is a Muslim empire or whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If it isn't those things, then what is it? Okay. Um, all right. We often call the book of Revelation apocalyptic. Uh, and then we study apocalyptic literature and we show how the book of Revelation is like it. And, and there's a lot of help in doing that. You know, it's cosmic, it's dualistic, it um, uses lots of bizarre imagery. That, that's fine. But fundamentally, the book is a message to seven churches that unveils through visions and hearing things, imagining things, of the corruption at work in the Roman Empire and how believers in Western Asia Minor can and should respond to the corruptions of the Roman Empire. So it's fundamentally a book, no kidding, about discipleship. And it's a book about a kind of discipleship that discerns the presence of Babylon in the world. Now, one of the things one of the themes that Cody Matchett and I, by the way, he's a Canadian uh, in Calgary. Um, uh, one of the themes that we develop is uh, that Babylon is timeless. So the, you know, we believe that the best way to read the book of Revelation is to start in chapter 17 to get a feel for the audience uh, to get a feel for the problem that the audience of the book is facing. The problem mm -hmm. is Rome's imposition of its ideology and idolatries upon the churches of Western Asia Minor and how the believers should respond. So I, I like to say this, the author wouldn't let, the editors wouldn't let me use this expression. It is a theopolitical discipleship. And we are offering a theopolitical hermeneutic for reading the book. Hmm. That is a, a, politi a divine politics, God's politics, um, for how to read the book and for how to discern in our world uh, the presence of corruptions in the powers. Yeah, that, you know, that reminds me of the book uh, by Michael Gorman. He talks about a theopolitical interpretation yeah. of Revelation. It's very similar to what you're, to what you're saying. Yeah, 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 totally. I love yeah. Michael Gorman's book. Yeah. Many years ago, yeah. Michael Gorman was at the same institution. He was lecturing at the seminary. I was teaching at the undergraduate at North Park. And he told me he was going to lecture on that. And he asked me if I would come over and... Uh, sort of, I don't know, I like respond to it. I said, I, I can't right now. I just can't because I don't know exactly where I want to land on some of these issues. And I, I wasn't, I didn't have the time at that 
at, at that moment in my career to be spending time working on the book of revelation. I was, I had other projects that I had agreed to write. So, so I'm, I totally agree with Michael Gorman. I mean, not with everything, but it's a great book. Yeah, I, again, I just think this is particularly for in our area, evangelicals in our area. And I, and I, as a pastor, I preached a lot of this kind of futuristic prophecy stuff. Uh, we thought we were ahead of the game because we were post trib um, we thought that yeah, kind of put right. us above the pre-trippers, but I, I've been it, there, brother. Yes. I've been. Um, but it's interesting. So what you're saying is specifically, this is to their situation of the Roman empire, but we can be, we should be discerning and looking for echoes of that Babylon in our governments today. Is that sort of what you're yeah, saying? Yeah. Yeah. That would be. Babylon is timeless. I'll say this. I've said this a hundred times in my classes. Babylon is timeless. Babylon is always present. There's always some Babylon at work in the state government, in the local village government, in church governments, in national governments, in world politics. Babylon is always around. If you just look at the major themes of Revelation 17 to 18, you're going you're gonna to say, yeah, it's, it's there. In your book, you talk about uh, Revelation uh, as a playbill. Uh, you know, the, the word playbill is a reference to the, the cast of characters in, Re in Revelation. And in there, you divide the characters of Revelation between two teams. You have the team Dragon in Babylon and then the team Lamb in Jerusalem. Why do you do this? And why is that important to a better reading of Revelation? Well, Dave Matthewson has a wonderful little book that introduces the book of Revelation. He's been, he wrote his dissertation on this. He teaches at Denver Seminary, a real good New Testament professor. And uh, he talked, I think he has a, a little, a, a chapter maybe on the characters of the drama or something like that. And I liked it. And um, I blogged about it a little bit. But then when I was... Uh, working on writing this chapter, this chapter, or lecturing it, actually. I talked about it as a lecture first. Um, somehow I saw someone's playbill somewhere, you know, one of those from a, from a stage production. And I thought, that's what we need. We need to use, we need to develop the playbill of the book of Revelation. There are characters in this book that need to be understood mm -hmm. rather than, Okay, we'll go back to the same thing. Rather than figuring out who they are predicting in the modern world, it, for us, we want to see them as characters on a stage that are dramatizing this battle between God and the dragon, uh, between the lamb and the dragon. And so we outline uh, team dragon and team uh, lamb. But it, maybe the word team the word team either came from a student in my class, John Rosenstiel, who's a pastor in Portland. He may have, he may have used the word team lamb or something like that. Hmm. But I was uh, many years ago, I was speaking in Lubbock, Texas, and a guy named Randy Harris was preaching in this conference. And he said, uh, here's, here's the book of revelation in three lines. Uh, God's team wins. So that's where the word team for me came from. God's yeah. team wins. Choose your team. Don't be stupid. And <laughs> so I've used this word team often in talking about the book of Revelation. But uh, you have to see it, it's it's an either or. This is the way apocalyptic literature works. Uh, whether you talk about First Enoch or Second Baruch, uh, th this these kinds of texts uh, will pose uh, good and bad. Uh, light and darkness, and Satan and Gog, and and so this sort of you know we, we want to set this up. If this were set into a drama, we would have these people in the these characters in the in the playbill. Mm -hmm. And so this drama is playing out in every generation. Like it played out in this in obviously for the first century hearers. And it's playing out every generation now, I think is what you're saying. And so what are some of the care, where would be some of the main characteristics sort of of Satan's team, as it were, yeah. as he, as this drama plays out in our generation, in our culture and space. Now we enter into the drama that has, has been played 
for 2,000 years, actually from since creation, hmm. since humans have been involved. Okay, so, um, so we enter into the drama. Um, the whole drama doesn't play out in every generation, but the whole drama um, should inspire believers so they know so they know uh, what team to, to land with and how to act on the stage. But here are the characteristics of Babylon that you asked for the, you know, what are the characteristics of, of Satan's team or team dragon? They are, from a Jewish and Christian perspective, Rome, Babylon is anti-God because the gods are idols rather than the true one God of Israel. One of the characteristics, and this is not in any order of importance, but as they emerge in the book, uh, in Revelation 17 and 18, is opulence. Uh, the attire of the whore of Babylon, or the whatever you want to call her, uh, of in, in Revelation 17 is just opulence upon opulence. It's like all of a sudden getting caught up in some attire of some king in Europe in the 18th century who had money upon money upon money. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been reading about how uh, I've been reading Suetonius's Lives of the Twelve Caesars, and it is amazing how much money the Roman emperors had from mm -hmm. Julius Caesar on. I mean, they financed the whole country because they all the taxes came to them. So it's really amazing. They were murderous. I mean, they put to death people who witnessed against them. And the number of people put to death by Roman emperors is astounding. Hmm. I mean, they had laws that if you, like under Tiberius, under Caesar Augustus, um, if you opposed them, in certain ways, they could just kill you. And this is what happens to believers. They are also fa uh, fascinated with image. They were way ahead of us in branding. The Roman emperor, the Roman empire had images everywhere in all their major cities that reminded people of who was in control of things. I mean, whether you're talking statues Paintings, buildings, even the architecture at times demonstrates that this is all about Rome. They were militaristic. I mean, the power of the Roman military um, was so efficient and so effective that countries would just bow to them because of their power. Now, there's a great line by Tacitus, I think we quoted in the book, I've quoted it in class a few times that, you know, they, they uh, brutally treat a place and then they call it peace. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. when you sub, when you subdue everybody and beat on everyone's head to where they bow down to you, that's not peace. Yeah. That's subjugation. <laughs> right. But they call that's Pax Romana. You know, it's Adrian peace. Goldsworthy's written about it. They economically exploited every country in the uh, empire. So if they wanted your grain, if they wanted your grapes, if they wanted your workers, if they wanted your stone, if they wanted your food, they wanted your whatever, they they made a way for it to start coming on ships. So Revelation 17 just describes these boats, you know, filled with stuff that the Roman that the Romans want. And then of course they were arrogant. Uh, and this is one of the major themes of Babylon in the history of Jewish literature, which becomes a trope that you use for the vile countries that are oppressing you at the time, mm -hmm. is, you know, they think that there's no one who can do anything to them. Like the Assyrians were like this, the Babylonians were this way, the Romans were this, the Greeks were a little bit this way. The Romans were definitely this way for centuries. They thought they ruled the world. And arrogance is one of the characteristics of political corruption in the world. So overall, it's about domination. Yeah. It's about one country wanting to dominate all the other countries. And if it if it fits your country, it's Babylon. 
Yeah. It fits the United States. Yeah. Not everyone all the time. Yeah. But each one some of the time. Right. And so that's where the Christian discernment comes in, yeah. is not yeah. looking to the future, oh, this is the European Union or this is yeah. the whatever. Yeah. This is, it's about looking to ourselves and seeing where is Babylon, if I'm getting you right here, yeah, and seeing it. where is Babylon uh, corrupting us. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly what it's about. Yeah. And so, Scott, what wow. would you say? What would you say are some of the characteristics of Babylon that we see today, in especially <laughs> in uh, North America? Well, I know in Canada is a perfect country. <laughs> yeah, you got that right. <laughs> it's run. It's run by Mennonites, who are always seeking peace, and uh, they don't ever argue with one another. And that's why, when I was in uh, um, Manitoba, I think that's the. Province. Yeah, yeah, that's yes, where we that's are. Where we, small are. T- we were in a small town. We were in a small town with twelve different Mennonite churches. Yeah, uh, <laughs> they evidently couldn't get along. Um, I w- I would say that. Um, all right, I'm I'm going to talk about the United States, okay. and it depends who the president is, doesn't it? Um, as to the themes that come up, I I think America is increasingly anti-God in yeah. a very serious way. Uh, there is a lack of reverence for God. America, the United States, is characterized by opulence by many people. I mean, we have, I think there's a number, something like this. This is in uh, uh, my book called uh, Pastor Paul. I wrote about this. It's like 90% of American garages have like 80% of the space filled with boxes. And do you know the number of, I mean, they have these buildings now where storage sites where people rent like space to put their extra junk. Yeah, we I have mean, those we, all over town here. Yeah, we are filled. This is, this is about opulence. Damn. I mean, think about what someone say, like Jesus in Galilee, what would have been in their house? You know, the extra pots on the floor are probably because they're broken, not mm-hmm. because they've got some for dinner and some for breakfast and some for lunch and some for when guests come over and some for when family comes over, we have even, even nicer stuff. So there's a lot of opulence. Um, I think um, image is important in the United States, uh, but I grew up when America had the image of the, it was sort of still in the amber glow of the victory of World War II over Hitler and and the uh, Axis powers. Um, So we had an image of the United States that was largely destroyed in the post-Reagan era. Reagan tried to re- uh, reinvent that that sort of image, make America great again. This is Donald Trump's yeah. thing. That that's the same thing that's trying to tap into something that no longer exists. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, I, I am embarrassed, and I've been fighting against this since the '70s, so for 50 years, um, about America's militarism. Um, mm-hmm. I just find it abominable how much money we spend on the military. Yeah. And we believe that we are capable of winning any war, and therefore we are really cool, and we're the greatest country. It's like the person who has a handgun. A person with a handgun senses an invincibility about their life. They, They are in control. Well, the United States has bombs that makes them feel. That's That's Rome. Economic exploitation, you know, you can listen to people who are really convinced that this is the case in the United States. Um, I'm not I'm not a, a radical anti-capitalist. It just depends how you define it and how you practice it. But uh, there is a lot of exploitation that, that occurs. And I, I think the United States' arrogance has been... Uh, it's, you know, it's chipped, but it's still standing. Mm-hmm. Something like that, you know. It's it, it's something in the past more than a reality. I think a lot of Americans 
recognize that America is not the image that it used to be. How's that for an answer? Well, I won't talk you. about Canada. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> we have our we have our own issues. Um, we're not big enough to be proud of our military, at least. But most <laughs> everything else, we've got problems with. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, and again, I just I find this so. I mean, I find this view of Revelation so refreshing. And and you know, we've Thank been you. going down this path for several years. You know, Michael Gorman and some like this, but. I'm just so looking forward to reading reading your book and, and just going to this interview. It's just awesome. But I just love, again, how you're taking Revelation and you're using it on ourselves. We're, yeah. we're to take it and to discern what's happening in our society. You're not predicting, oh, the United States is the Antichrist and Donald Trump is is what was predicted or, or Obama or whoever. Yeah. You're just saying the elements of Babylon are here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you're critiquing, and then now, how do we how do we change this? I, I just think that's so powerful, and it makes it so much more applicable. Which brings up uh, this idea you talk about uh, in in the book, which is a prophetic call to follow Jesus as a dissident disciple. So, what does that mean? How does Revelation challenge us to be a new kind of disciple? Mm-hmm. Well. Um, and we have different sections in the book. This is not a commentary. It's a, instead, it's an attempt to give people a way of reading the book uh, more accurately. Uh, but, it, you know, it explains things as well. If you start in Revelation chapter 2 through 3, and then you read chapter 6 through 16, but especially chapter 17 and 18, you will see in chapters 2 and 3 connections between what is being criticized in the church and what is characteristic of Babylon. There, John is doing exactly what we are called to do. In other words, discern Babylon's influence in the church. Mm -hmm. Wow. When we discern the presence of Babylon in the church, we have the opportunity to become witnesses in the sense that we speak up and we speak out. Now, we call them double dissidents. A double dissident is someone who recognized the corruption in Babylon. That's one level and and is a dissident against Babylon, Mm -hmm. but then witnesses to its presence in the church and becomes a dissident of its presence in the church, double dissidents. So, that's that's the uh, I think that's one of the key dimensions of discipleship in the book of Revelation about dissidents is to be discerning enough to see the presence of Babylon in the world and then to resist it and to speak against it, to speak up, to speak out. And a witness in the book of Revelation is not just someone who speaks up and speaks out, but they put their life on the line yeah. and some of them will die. Uh, there are there's evidence in the book of Revelation of people being put to death, and there um, so a witness. You know the Greek word for witness in the New Testament is martus, from which we get the word martyr. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, martyr only means someone who's killed. Yeah. Uh, in the New Testament, a martus is someone who verbally witnesses what they have seen or heard or believed. And then at times will suffer. They'll live the con- they'll live out the consequences of their witness. Yeah. Wow. So uh, the other, I don't know if you're going to get into this in another question, but the other side of dissidence in the book of Revelation is worship. Mm-hmm. In chapter six through sixteen, we have these songs. There, uh, uh, we list eight songs in the book of Revelation. Um, and, you know, they're classically called hymns. Uh, that's, that's because um, white guys are singing hymns in their churches. Uh, but Brian Blount, an African-American New Testament scholar, a Presbyterian on the East Coast, Brian Blount is the one who taught me or read, because I read him, that these are more like African-American spirituals than they are like mm. Christian hymns. Mm-hmm. And when you read these as spirituals, and my students like to do this, they, they have fun with this because they like dissidents. They, 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 they like to be a dissident. Um, you realize that these, when you worship God on the throne, you are actually resisting Caesar on yeah. the throne. 
So to sing the song is an act of sabotage and subversion of the presence of Babylon in the church and in the world. Well, and we, so uh, we we kind of we talk about it as witness and worship. Yeah, yeah, like worship is political, really. Because when yeah, we say yeah. Jesus is Lord, we are saying that Caesar is not. And so yeah. it, it's the key part of witnessing. I think, I think uh, it's implicit in a lot of New Testament stuff that if we say Jesus is Lord, Caesar is not. But it doesn't become conscious like it does in the book of Revelation. So, for instance, yeah. Paul in Romans 13 is not exactly your classic dissident. Uh, you know, right. that's not yeah. that's not really sabotage. Although John Howard Yoder and and Stanley Hollerwas try to make it that way, that's it's kind of cool for the Anabaptists to to make it like that. But I think overall, the Book of Revelation is a witness to a Christian life that has come to the point where they realize they have to resist. Hmm. But it's it's fundamentally not about rebelling against Rome. It's about resisting the presence of Rome in the church mm -hmm. and then establishing a culture that is, in a sense, an alternative to the Roman Empire, where Jesus is the Lord and the King. So. Okay, so I just have to jump. Can you help us make that a bit more practical? Chris asked you before where you see Babylon in our culture, and you answer very honestly and vulnerably about some of America's stuff, which... 99% applies to us as Canadians too. Where do you see Babylon's corruption? Like what do we need to be dissidents against in those, before you talked about how team dragon, opulence, branding an image, exploitative, arrogant. Do you see those? How do you see those? Where do you see those corrupting kind of the church as a whole here in North America? Well, yes, that's, um, um, you know, the book of Revelation tends to focus on sexual immorality and idolatry uh, more than anything else, or coolness of witness, you know, a lack of courage to, to be the dissident. But I think if we map out the characteristics of Babylon in Revelation 17 and 18, we, we, are, giving a, we are given a language to that expresses uh, what can happen in the church. So in it depends what church you're in, doesn't it? I mean, if mm -hmm. you're in Willow Creek in its heyday, you could say there's a, there's a lot of opulence because there was a lot of money coming into that. I mean, I was there one time when they got like pledged $80 million on a weekend. Now they didn't wow. get that. They didn't get that money, but pledged for <laughs> something they were going to build or do so. I mean, wow. that's a lot of money, you know. <laughs> that's, um, yeah, that's a lot. Our seminary would take that, but we yeah, are. I was about uh, to say we we could use some of that over yeah. here. Um, so I think opulence is a characteristic, and and that's not one of the big. There's a little bit of this you see in the church, in the letter or the message for the church at Laodicea. You know, the the language you think you're rich, but you're actually poor. Um, yeah. A sense of image. It is very um, characteristic of megachurches to brand themselves. Yeah. And, um, and this branding uh, is a way of distinguishing a church, let's say, from other churches and from everyone else. So all of a sudden now, this church has a brand characteristic of it that distinguishes it from other churches. And this divides the body of Christ, this uh -huh. branding of churches. And um, I, I think that's a characteristic in, in churches. Uh, I, I think the American flag at the front of a church is militarism. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's nationalism and militarism, and I don't like it. You know, at the top of a flagpole, the United States is an eagle, and that was Rome's, you know, one of its images for its military. Oh, interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. e economic exploitation uh, Churches can exploit communities. Churches can exploit people in the church. People can uh, churches can exploit other businesses. So I think that's something that we should pay attention to. But always at the bottom of any presence of Babylon is arrogance, 
And so mm. churches that have a, an arrogant conviction and confidence in how good it is and how important it is and how important its pastor is and how great his sermons or her sermons are and how great their worship team are. Um, this, this is Babylon. You know, uh, we're not there to prove that we are the best preachers. We're there to draw people to Jesus. And when we supplant Jesus, we got Babylon. So, those are some, you know, I'm a, I'm a professor and an author. You, you guys are the pastors. You're the ones who work it into the local churches. Yeah. <laughs> well, th- thank you for helping us. Wow. I, was, yeah. I got lots to chew on right there. Uh, yeah. So, Scott, um, I, I didn't put the question down in the list, but uh, it's very much related to what you said about uh, this uh, drama, the Revelation Ears. And uh, you, I think you referenced it in your book, but I'm not quite sure. But at the beginning of Revelation, in chapter 1, verse 3, we have this phrase, Blessed is the one who keeps the words of this prophecy. Um, and then you see that phrase again at the end of the book of Revelation, in chapter 22, mm-hmm. verse 7. Again, blessed mm-hmm. is the one who keeps the words of this prophecy. That word, keep... Um, I've I've heard I've heard that word explained in different ways, but do you have any comments on on what keeping this prophecy might mean in relation to what we've said about witnessing and uh, and all those other words? Um, I you know I don't have the Book of Revelation memorized in Greek, but I'm assuming that Greek word is tereo to keep, yeah. Yeah. and it, yeah, so. Uh, This is a word that could be very easily connected in the Jewish world to observe, you know, observance of the Torah, Torah observance. Mm. Um, So it is someone who observes and let's just say they, they listen, they see the visions, they imagine those visions, and they live in light of the vision that God is going to bring judgment upon corruption Mm-hmm. and is going to bring justice in New Jerusalem. And they live that way. In other words, they become people who follow the Lamb in the middle of the empire, yeah. and they suffer the consequences, or they just become witnesses of the Lamb in the empire. So I, I would say that's the primary idea of keeping, rather than figuring out who's being predicted in which passage. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we've only got a few minutes left in this conversation. Well, I, and again, thank you so much for spending time with us. This has just been incredible. Uh, I'd like to, I, I know a lot of our listeners, and this wasn't in the list that Chris sent you either, but I just want to throw this in there because people are obsessed with, you know, the, the seals, the trumpets, the bulls. Hey, you know, COVID, that, you know, is that the disease that's going to kill or the next, what, you know, the avian influenza uh, I think it's so ingrained in people to read these as specific prophecies of future events. Yeah. So, so if that's not what they are, kind of what are they and how should people read those seals, trumpets, and bulls? You know, this is a, uh, this is a hard one because uh, this, is the, this is the language of God pouring out judgment on evil in the world. Okay, and it partakes in visions, uh, prophecies in the Old Testament. So it's it's constantly it's a bricolage. You know, there's a. I know you're Canadian, so you all know French. A bricolage. <laughs> it's, it puts it puts together these different images from different prophets without quoting them. So they, um, that's that's a, a characteristic of these. But uh, I think the other thing to see is the. Storyline of the book of Revelation, the drama, is judgment on evil and establishment of justice. The story of everything, as we as we uh, say it, it comes from a, a professor at Duke. So, and then there's another element to it. So, in other words, uh, we have to see what this is actually accomplishing. It's accomplishing the elimination of evil and corruption so that corruption, the arrogance, 
the military exploit and economic exploitations of the Roman Empire is going to come to an end because God is not going to allow this to happen forever. But there's something else that happens in those judgments that I think is neglected. I think I think I got this from Richard Baucom, who is maybe the world's greatest scholar on the book of Revelation. I love that guy. Um, Baucom makes the observation that when you look at the visions in these uh, these interludes in the book of Revelation, you discover that there are myriads and myriads of people worshiping the Lamb. Hmm. Now, I want you to imagine yourself as a believer in Western Asia Minor. And how many, you're in Ephesus, and how many believers are there? And that's the biggest church in Western Asia Minor, probably. Or let's just say you're in Hierapolis, or you're in uh, Laodicea. How many believers are there? You know, probably not very many. So when you when you look at this and you're reading, you think myriads and myriads and myriads of believers. Where are they coming from? Well, I believe the Book of Revelation, uh, those visions of the seals and the bowls, etc., the trumpets, are actually divine disciplines against the world that is sort of breaking down corruption and leading people to worship God through the Lamb. Because by the time you get to the end, there's all these millions of people who have, have become believers. So I think the drama leads to a sense that God is going to break through in this world and lead thousands and thousands of people to the Lord Jesus. Hmm. So that that's what I see in those. But the one thing I think we need to avoid is turning this into vindictive, punitive violence uh, yes. Yes. against humans. Yes. Mm-hmm. This is divine discipline, um, and it is an it is a way of describing. It's sort of like the the Chronicles of Narnia, Last Battle, or the Lord of the Rings. I haven't read all three volumes ever. I've yeah. tried, but uh, <laughs> I love those you, books. There's always these battles going on. Mm-hmm. Well, you don't look at these as you know this is this is really cruel and brutal. You just say yes, the wi- the good people are going to win. Yeah, that's what ha- happens in Revelation. The good mm-hmm. people are going to win because God is going to win, and uh, that's going to bring justice. And the end is to eliminate all of evil, and that's what hell is in the Book of Revelation. It's where all the evil is sent, and mm-hmm. therefore eradicated, so that the whole world can be the way God designed the whole world to be. Oh, shoot. I would love to jump into a discussion on hell. But <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, if well, you, you won't get time, it from me. me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Scott, oh. our, our time is up here. Uh, thank you so much again for uh, spending yeah. time with us. I so appreciate this. Yeah. Yes. Well, it was good. Chris has yeah. been writing me for a long time. I kept holding him <laughs> off because I, I didn't want to send you a manuscript until I thought it was about ready. So, well, thank, yeah. you. thank you so much. We will be telling everybody here to get a copy of this book and, and read it. And, uh, and yeah, thanks. Thanks again. Okay. Thank you. All right, that is it for another awesome conversation. Make sure you come back in two weeks for our next episode. And again, if this show has been one that you have enjoyed and you are excited about, please help us out by liking, subscribing, and sharing this podcast as more episodes are released. If you have any questions about anything that has been said in these episodes, please let us know at OutsideTheWall at CrossviewChurch.ca. Thank you, and we'll see you again.